Hey, that's pretty damn good. 143 points in this one for the Raptors as they beat the Spurs, almost setting records of all kinds. The personal ones for the players, the team-wide ones for the team. This is the Raptors Reaction Podcast. I'm, of course, your host, Samson Folk. And joining me for the celebration of this big Raptors win, because we do want to celebrate it, is Fandi Arberheni, who is the lead reporter for the Steve Dangle Podcast Network. It's getting off the ground as far as their basketball work. They picked S. They said, this is the guy to do it. So make sure you follow them. Yes, on YouTube, the podcast that's forthcoming, his written work, five things you know, five things you don't, all that kind of stuff. But the game, S, uh, big takeaways off the jump. Damn, I appreciate the plug like that. But yes, no, it was was a fun game. And also, I will say, uh, first time seeing and hearing the intro live. So it's cool to see what the behind the scenes process is, if you will. Um, But yeah, no, this was... This one, this was one where, look, you expected the Raptors to handle business, especially with, you know, Devin Vassell and Keldon Johnson not playing for the Spurs. Um, they're testing out a lot of their bench units, and the Raptors really took advantage, especially in the first quarter, where they just ran them out the gym, dude. That's essentially what it was. They ate in transition. They feasted off of turnovers. Um, and it got them into a rhythm that they kind of didn't fall out of. So one of the big things, and and we'll kind of focus in on just OG here. I know you've done a lot of work looking at OG's tape, as have yeah. I. And I just want to like ask you, OG, to start this season, we're now eight games in. The Raptors are five and three, one forty three to one hundred. Another night with five steals. You tweeted it out that statistic, right? That this is the first time anybody's ever had two games back to back. Not not back to back, but doing back to back twice of five steals plus and five steals plus. OG is a ball hawk, the likes of which uh, the Raptors have quite literally never seen. I'm curious what Mm -hmm. you've thought about his defense, maybe DPOY, all NBA, all that kind of stuff currently. Yeah, I mean, look, if he continues at this pace, why not include him in the defensive player of the year conversation? I mean, it obviously depends on, you know, where the Raptors end up in terms of their ranking on defense. But the way that he's playing and how important he is, funny enough, to both sides of what they do, because what he does is, you know, forced turnovers which gets the mountain running and we saw a great example of that tonight we also saw a great example of that against atlanta where it was essentially the exact same recipe he's causing these turnovers they get out and running and then it's just you know essentially a relay from there um but i i think that's the thing that makes him so important to the defensive aspect of the raptors is the fact that they rely on him to force these turnovers. Um, you know, last year, obviously, Gary led the, I believe it was, he led the team in deflections, but Fred overtook him throughout the season. Can't remember exactly what it was, but those guys were really high on the deflection charts. I think OG will will undoubtedly end up there as well this season. Um, hopefully he stays healthy. I really think that's the biggest, you know, factor here when it comes to what he projects to be when the season ends. But right now, the dude is playing phenomenal defense, just switching in terms of the actions that he's trying to like essentially stop dead in their tracks at the point of attack. He's rotating. He's on a string consistently and on ball. He can guard your beats. He can guard your, you know, Trey Young's and then he can go ahead and guard, you know, the, the guys who are his size as well. So there's really no flaws when it comes to his defensive game. He can do it all. And that's what makes him so special. It was really great to watch him tonight because I know some people are waiting around. They they look at this game and they say, maybe with Fred out, there's an opportunity for OG to take more reps offensively to work on some of that creation stuff. And there was like a smidge of that. But this is a guy who he didn't have to take anything offensively because his defense was feeding into that. That's always been such a big plus in his game is that there's just no way that this guy is going to be an empty on either side of the floor. Because even if the offense, the half-court stuff isn't going so well, there's just a chance, and a very good one, that he's going to supply himself with like four, six points just off of that that pick six. Kem Birch had one in this game, which was pretty crazy, and I think yeah. a, a great comment on, or a great insight to how the Spurs were struggling to get anything going. The Raptors off the start, that length, Coloco in the middle, especially when the Spurs, I think they were 7 of 24 to start out from three, in like the first half a little bit, you know, after that. And it, it was great to watch because you look at Ananobi, Siakam, Coloco, Trent Jr., Barnes. Trent is the only guy who's not extremely long in that group, but he's also quite active and wants to steal, will help, will dig down and stuff like that. 
And the Raptors defensive effort just off the start, making sure that nobody could get a pass entry into the paint by all crowding mm -hmm. it. And also then once the Spurs were kind of like, okay, it's tough to get in there and started working out the perimeter, the Raptors started pushing the shell of their defense. So it was, just, it was yeah. so impressive. Yeah. It's, it's cool that you mentioned that. Cause I remember at the start of the game, I was like, and they are being aggressive with Jakob. Like they're throwing a bunch of doubles at him, making sure that he kind of kicks it out. And I think that kind of goes to your point where it's like, Hey, th these guys did, they, they specified the fact that they wanted to negate anything they were doing inside, anything the Spurs wanted to get inside. And that really helped throughout the thing so that's a that's a good observation on your front samson i appreciate it um <laughs> yeah. hey I, I, I was gonna i was gonna ask you real quick just a real quick question um with fred out for the second game uh do you like the way that they are staggering the starters currently where it is in the second quarter i believe it was scotty and og that were running the lineup primarily and then they were running a little bit of pascal and og out there as well but what would you would you think about them kind of staggering the guys so one of the big deals heading into the season was the OG and Scotty stagger with the bench lineups. That transitional lineup is something I'll be keeping an eye on all year because that is one of the routes to getting Siakam rest. That's one of the yeah. routes to getting Van Vliet rest. I saw you had a tweet about it that, hey, if Van Vliet is healthy, this is also something where, you know, the Raptors, uh, if they have both those guys off the floor, that's a good thing if they can win those minutes. They smashed in those minutes. I think they were... Man, probably close to like a plus 12, between plus 12 and plus 15 in those minutes. A great run to end the half where they took that lead. And, you know, it was it was kind of close. Pascal was carrying a unit with some isolation shot making. But they start, that length was getting them started in early offense, that pseudo transition and transition stuff. Scotty was making some inspired passes. And, you know, if Chris Boucher is just going to be able to spot up and like can triples and stuff like that, that's always going to help swing possessions. Uh there was also like, it was a bit clunky in the half court, which if you're not playing the Spurs without Vassell and without like their best guys in this one, then it's going to, you're going to be able to get into transition a lot more. I wonder what it looks like against a team that's more well prepared to not allow the Raptors transition offense to get, you know, started so often. Yeah. But I think you have to look at that and say like, it's a massive positive, one of the largest coming out of this game. It's very interesting to me. And by the way, that lineup was Scotty OG, Precious, Otto, and I believe they had Gary in there for a little bit, and then Coloco was Coloco. Was Coloco was in there kind for of, a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah especially at the beginning. Uh, I don't know. I, I think to your point, that is the key. And and you know, with Otto coming in, I know he didn't necessarily have too much of an impact or an imprint on tonight. It was his debut, missing missing the first eight games or seven games. I think this this is to show you that with auto, the hierarchy of the bench kind of makes sense. Everybody kind of aligns or shifts down a little bit, and it makes more sense the lineups that they throw out there. I don't know if you necessarily agree with that, but I, I guess in the sense that they just have a little bit more versatility to them now because of the fact that, you know, auto can be inserted into these lineups every now and then. And it's also tough because, like, where are you going to get minutes for, for Thad and Kem and whatnot as well, right? Yeah, I think Otto, the ideal version of Otto, the healthy version of Otto, not only does he make, you know, the bench work, but he also makes, you know, a lot more of the staggering lineups work. And yeah. it's, we, we've we seen, I mean, we've seen games this year, like the Nets game, the Raptors barely lose that game. I, I believe Banton was like a minus 15 in seven minutes or something like that. We've seen games where uh, Achua has had a tough start in some of these games. Boucher has been great. I don't want to say anything about Boucher. Um, even though I believe Achua will have a better year at the end of it, Boucher has been better to start this season. Uh, Coloco has had tough minutes. Flynn has had tough minutes. Otto Porter Jr. should be a salve of sorts, not only to replace those guys or those minutes in a more effective manner, but also in some of these lineups, Otto should be able to, with his shooting, his positional defense, and his ability to rebound on both ends, be able to help lift up and make those guys' games more palatable. And that's the big deal that I'm expecting to see because the Raptors, if Pascal is going to be the engine, we've seen, I'll have a video about this up at Yahoo Sports, I guess in a couple days, maybe about how Gary's playing off of and has been affected by Pascal's being doubled so often, you know, 
big uptick in catch and shoot. You see the frequencies on and off the court with Pascal, more threes versus less threes, but better looks and a higher percentage when Pascal's out there. It's There's a bunch of things that cascade and affect each other. And Otto has the skill set to just step into this. And while tonight is nothing to write home about, as you mentioned, he hasn't played the first seven games, just had a kid. Congratulations to him working back into it. But the ideal of his profile, his skill set, is basically yeah. perfect. And you and I have both talked about this in the summer and in the lead up to the season, too. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. I, um, I think, you know, there's there's this weird thing about injuries sometimes being a blessing in disguise. And obviously, that's not necessarily the case. But I, I think with Fred being out, it does give them the benefit of trying certain lineups that they wouldn't be able to with Fred you know, healthy and, and seeing what kind of works and what can't work. Now you throw thread, thread back into that lineup and okay, you know, we've mentioned this before, but the fact that Fred is such a plug and play guy makes it so that you can experiment a little bit while he's out and then just plug him into whatever situation makes the most sense. Yeah. It's also the fact that like the Raptors, they, they won minutes with their no guard lineups, but also, mm -hmm. you know, there's teams have to have lineups that work. And they have to have a lot of different lineups that work. The Raptors, of course, should be able to lean into their no guard stuff. But also, you know, Otto, if Pascal leaves the floor and maybe Scotty doesn't have it one night, and we'll talk about Scotty right after this. But if Scotty doesn't have it one night and Fred is running, you know, a lot of pick and roll, maybe if Fred is doing that, get to 16 feet, get no deeper pass out offense. A guy like Otto also enhances that a lot because it's not it's not only a guy who hits wide open shots from the corner, but he hits right. contested shots from three all over the place. As long as it's catch and shoot, he, he makes that more more tenable as an offense. So he just he adds a lot. But Scotty, I think a lot of people Scotty was off the gas once the Raptors really made their run. And once they were up by like 25, Scotty wasn't really pressing the same way. But to start out this game, he ends up with 15, 4, and 5. He was tremendous. Reads on the floor great, pushing the pace great. You know, some isolations where he's busting out combos. I'm curious what you thought of Scotty's game in this one. Just not afraid of contact. That's my favorite thing about him. It's just he is ready to, like, go straight into your chest on a drive. Um, and I think that's such an impressive thing to have as a young guy in this league. Um, it's something that... For some players, it wears off if they're really aggressive to start their career and then they start to slowly be less aggressive as their career goes because they develop a jump shot, because they become more prone to jump shots. This is not a very good like comp to, to Scotty, but Serge Ibaka used to, when he was on OKC, just an incredible athlete who was run rolling to the rim, finishing near the rim, aggressive, right? But as his jump shot kind of developed a little bit more, he became more of a perimeter oriented player. I thought that was such a like, again, they're not similar in the sense of the way that they play. But I think that's something to look at when you look at Scotty and the way he's developing his jump shot, how much more he can keep that aggressiveness or maintain that aggressiveness that he has, because I think that's his best quality. It's it's being able to finish around the basket. And that was on display tonight. The playmaking is clearly something that everybody will want to talk about. Just the fact that, you know, Point Scott was was mentioned a lot. I saw it a lot on the timeline. He made some incredible one-handed passes. I don't know if that's something that caught your attention too, but it's just the one-handed, you know, dodgeball throw type stuff that he does that really catches your eye. Um, I, I wonder what you think about, you know, kind of it's standstill stuff that he does, which is more on the connector side of things. But do you see a, a, a route to, you know, so-called point Scotty? Yeah, I think it's cool that we get, you said injuries, blessing, disguise, all that kind of stuff. When we look at Fred, you know, hopefully that back gets to full health. And then these yep. games can just be seen as a couple, three, four, however many games where Scotty got to initiate and do some more things. You know, he, he had a play off the start where he threw that lob to Coloco. And it's because... They did it in early offense, a step-up screen. And what does Scotty get to do? He gets to go downhill quickly. Coloco, you know, they they collapse on Scotty. He's athletic, not afraid of contact. They're going to collapse. Tosses it up there. That's a possession that's really nice to see in early offense that we maybe don't always get or don't get the same volume of. And we saw some of that against Atlanta as well, initiation stuff. We also saw, you know, as you said, connector stuff. 
I thought it was mostly connector stuff in this game. Yeah. And yeah. um, like, of course, his transition stuff will always be with the ball in hand. And he's already one of the best transition players in the NBA. Great vision. But in this game, we're looking at a guy that, for the most part, was using his motion as kind of this dangerous affectation on the Spurs defense. And not even necessarily as a passer, but Scotty just being willing to press with the ball and also to kind of bang around to establish a position to get into dangerous spots against the Spurs. I think we've kind of seen it all between the Hawks game and this one. And I'm curious to see if we see volume in either, I guess, boat of decision making, kind of how he decides to play. If if next game Fred isn't back and if he has still has those possessions or whatever, but it's yeah. uh it's been really great. Wow, Pascal finished with a triple double. I just noticed. I didn't think he got the ten <laughs> rebounds. That's oh no! Incredible. So so they so apparently uh, midway through the fourth, NBA Stats.com just randomly updated it, gave him the tenth rebound. Well, I'll be. Yeah, that's his second yeah. one of the season. Then it is good for him. He's uh he's unstoppable. In many facets, any any Scotty things <laughs> before we before we talk about Pascal, obviously. No, I I mean I think you you hit it on the head with Scotty. I think look, it, it'll be interesting to see how he develops if Fred ends up missing a lot more games here. Um, but at the same time, I think another aspect of that are, is those kind of transitional lineups, the bench lineups, and I'm sure with Auto back now, we'll see even more of that. See more experimentation there, and I think that's that's another area or another spot where Scotty can can be seen trying things, which will be good for him. I just I love when he tries things, man, and that's that's yeah. one of the most fun aspects. And it's really nice that he gets to try it in such a an incubator. You know, mm -hmm. it's never sitting on his shoulders. This isn't, and I'm not doing Cade versus Scotty thing. This is just the context they live in. But if Cade doesn't go out there and hoop. Detroit is in a very funky, precarious oh, spot. Yeah. If yeah. Scott Scotty can, for the most part, he can ebb in and out of you know effectiveness as young players often do. But uh, actually, Scotty, the defense, he he still, for my taste, gets a little high. But those three quarter presses he does, this reminded me of college, and maybe this speaks to you know the quality of of Trey Jones or Sohan or Langford or. You know, any Josh Richardson, Branham, those guys. But Scotty, this was the best he's ever looked in three quarter press to me, for what it's <laughs> worth. I don't, uh, know if you, I don't know. I mean, yeah. All right. Well, like, I mean, you know, it's tough to say that against the third stringers on the I I feel you. I feel you. I understand. But it's also like, ah, uh, I don't know how much I can take away from that. Yeah. With, you know. He, he was influential at the point of attack in this game. I <laughs> This is the first time I ever watched. And I was like, these guys feel Scotty a lot. Whereas yeah. there's been quite a few guards who it's like, and it's maybe they do like the Smitty get by him, like an escape dribble burst, whatever. But yeah, uh, Scotty, his defense on the whole, I've been pretty impressed with all season. And I thought this was one of the most impactful point of attack. Although caveats, uh, you know, abound. Pascal yeah. though, uh, 22 points, 10 boards, 11 assists. Three turnovers. Uh, one of them was on a an offensive foul. So like that was weird. That was weird. That 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 one usually there. doesn't get called. I'll say, but you know, another fantastic game where Pascal, in isolation, he's just killing dudes. If the double comes, he makes the right read all the time. Yeah. You know, this is a game where the Raptors didn't need him to be a superstar. Which for people who are subscribed over Raptors Republic is what my piece will be about uh, for tomorrow. But Pascal was still a superstar regardless. And I'm um, like, you watch his game. Are you looking for adjectives? Are you trying to describe I, certain no, sets? I'm, you know, I'm perplexed, man. You really, you're just sitting there and you're like, man, this is the best I've ever seen him play. And like, that's not a hyperbole. Like we've seen some very good Pascal Siakam in the past. We've seen NBA finals going up against Draymond Green, Pascal Siakam. We've seen, most improved player, Pascal Siakam. We've seen leading the league at rim percentage, Pascal Siakam. We've seen all NBA Pascal. This is the best version he's been at. Like, there's no question in my mind that he, the comfort level that he has, the joy that he's playing the game with, it just seems like he's having fun out there, especially tonight against San Antonio, where it didn't seem like he needed to, like, there was no pressure on him to be the guy, like you said tonight, right? And that was so phenomenal to see he had five assists in the first quarter and i didn't even notice 
And I think a lot of that, it goes back to he's playing within himself. He's playing within the system of, of what the Raptors are trying to do. And it's just rinse and repeat for him now. It, the double comes, he finds the open guy, it's a shot. Or, you know, they, they kind of create something out of that. And that's the recipe for the Raptors' half-court offense. It's can Pascal create an advantage for us, and we will go from there. We'll figure it out from there. He did it today. He's been doing it the whole season, and I expect that to continue. <laughs> it's We saw ring night, 34-18, and 18, I believe yeah. Pascal had. This player... You know, first day games, every game in and out. He is so much better than the guy who put up 34 and 18. And quite yeah. frankly, it's not close. He's <laughs> he's calculated. He's clinical. He's almost he's like incorrigible, right? Without reform, you cannot influence him in any way that he's uncomfortable. You send the double. He doesn't like his passing angles. Escape dribble out. Reengage. You leave him in isolation. Well, we see he's just cooking dudes, any yeah. dude, Evan Mobley, Jeremy Sohan, uh, Malachi Branham uh, across these eight games. It's been a <laughs> lot of dudes, Royce O'Neal, Kevin Durant, whoever, right? Yeah. And I was we, about to say, you should probably list off the players who, yeah, you know, I wanna, you went know, Malachi Branham. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's topical podcast. I want people to be like, oh yeah, that game, Malachi Branham got cooked. Josh Richardson got cooked just so we're keeping it uh, you know, on topic. But this is a guy who's just been absolutely phenomenal. and. Quite frankly, like with a live dribble in the middle of the floor, you know, send a double. There's nobody better at it in the league. I know today some numbers got posted where people saw that while Pascal, I believe, is eighth in double frequency, um, how often he gets doubled, the points per possession that the Raptors are getting out of it off of Pascal doubles is number one in the NBA. And that's... uh, I can't tell you how big a deal that is and how much that affects the ability for the other guys on the roster to make plays. We saw it again tonight, of course, but we've seen it for eight games now. And I'm guessing as a fan, as a listener, you're going to see this for the next 74. You're going to see it in the playoffs as well. It is uh, it is very hard to concoct a game plan that vexes Pascal, where he doesn't yeah you know, impart his influence somehow and in a very meaningful way. I I almost don't have words, dude. I don't know if you have. I I understand. No, I understand. I understand why you're speechless because it really is at this point. It's, it's regular Samson, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond explanation because look, this is the norm. Now, this is the way that Pascal Siakam plays basketball. We need to all adjust to the fact that he is this type of player and he's phenomenal. Um, I, I will say, I think to the escape dribble thing, it kind of just gave me a little ding. Um, the escape dribble, and I mentioned this in the the video that I made about Pascal in terms of like stacking skills, but he would not be able to be so elite at that escape dribble if it wasn't for dealing with the double teams against Boston in the bubble, dealing with the you know help the the coverage that he received throughout that next season in Tampa where he was being hounded by double teams and he had to kind of figure it out. I still remember that game against Portland on the road where he was just knifing through defenses with his playmaking. That was a glimpse into what we see now. And I I think it's just a perfect way to kind of show like the development never stops for Pascal. And what we see right now is kind of the culmination of this. The last two, three years for Pascal was just grinding it out. It, it seemed like he was trying to figure something out and he was on the cusp of something like a genius that was on the cusp of an, uh, of an invention. And, you know, he's found it out. It, he's had his, what was it? What's that quote? Like, Oh, um, if you try something, I can't remember what inventor said, it, but like you try it a million times and then that million and first time it's, it's the right time. It feels like Pascal got it right must on the million. Have, and- must've been Elon Musk who said it, right? That was the, that was the guy. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct, though, is that when you look at the Tampa Bay season, that was the first time that Pascal wasn't with Kyle, like n- not that he wasn't with Kyle, but that Kyle oftentimes didn't share the floor with him. And Kyle wasn't like a massive part of the offense and working at. Th- and also his his pull up three pointer went away from him. He didn't have that in his game anymore. And the Raptors went to the post a lot with Pascal that year. This created that that interplay of like, OK, dig down escape double you know escape or pass out it's just like seeing all the different permutations of the help side defense comes from the bottom okay i i kind of know what that looks like it's guy closest to the ball comes from the top all the different ways he saw so much of it 
last year he really perfect like not perfected it but he was tremendous at it and this year he's just unstoppable in that format of offense and the cool thing about that is that it requires nothing the raptors can lean into that by the way one of the best offenses in the league when that happens to pascal they can lean into that whenever they please and you know miami had the best game plan against pascal so far this season san antonio's was not close to that tonight whether it was by <laughs> schematics or by uh the people capable of you know playing defense but it's uh he's been an absolute treat gary trent jr i actually just want to shout out because this year for him has largely been a guy playing off of other players yeah that wasn't the case tonight gary trent for the most part you're looking at a guy 24 points two boards two assists two steals this is a guy for the most part who was creating his own looks and this is you know manipulation off the dribble you know a couple good cuts here and there he had a couple catch and shoot shots of course but for the most part a guy who's taking the ball engaging his defender either in isolation or with the screen finding his way to a jump shot finding his way to the rim a couple times like had a wrong-footed floater with his right hand over Pirtle, i believe that's yep. really really nice to see that doesn't mean i want him to stop being like the ultimate off-ball guy that's very good for his game but in a game like this, especially early on when the Raptors were like, okay, where are we getting offense from? The fact that Gary stepped in was like, me, just me. I'm going to be out there hitting shots. That was <laughs> awesome. It's uh, it's good to see that on these nights he can kind of carry the load. And le- that's that's been the Raptors. Um, that's been the Raptors MO for a very long time now. It's like, who's going to contribute tonight? It's not really a, we're going to funnel things through one guy, although you can make the argument that they probably should start doing that with Pascal. Um uh, yeah, no, they, they play this offensive by committee, offense by committee style. They've done it for such a long time, especially under Nurse. Um, Gary just steps in and, and has these sort of nights, and I think it's great to have that type of player. You mentioned the the off-the-dribble stuff. I thought um, there was that possession where he had the layup, but there was another possession where he actually made a nice pass to Scotty in the pick and roll. If you know, if you remember that, that was also something that was really, really, I, it caught me. I'm like, Whoa, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good dump off. Like that, that was impressive to me. So him getting those opportunities to play on ball a little bit more, be a little bit more, um, I guess just have more reps in the pick and roll. That's going to go a long way. And just, you know, in another playmaker, uh, for the Raptors, which is, it's great to see. I mean, that's, that is one of the ways that Gary Trent, a guy like, even in transition, we saw he still had trouble finishing at the rim in the half court. Yeah. Like that, they, technically, I don't know if that would count as a rim finish. If it was, it would be counted as like from five feet and out or three feet and in. But that that wrong footed floater, that's a uh, that's not like getting to the rim. That's not like putting a lot of pressure on the defense. That's a great counter for a guy who does not typically get there. And if Gary is a guy who he's drawing like these higher. You know, bigs come out higher against his screening actions, his dribble handoffs, pick and rolls. If they have to play at the level because of that shooting and not even that shooting, but it's like he's so comfortable with that step back that he comes around, gets his guy into jail. You need 100 percent to have your big step up or be present. If he's a guy who demands that, then that means slips, rolls are just way easier for his bigs to find space. And if he's willing to pass into that space. It just you've added, you know, this whole new interplay to how he navigates those situations and two assists. Maybe we're, you know, kind of overstepping, you know, with how big, a, <laughs> you know, he's averaging like one point five on the season so far. But it, it would be nice if he's making reads downhill to guys in, in those plays. But uh, the bench, Boucher, Achua are the big names. Boucher played in the more meaningful minutes. Precious Achua in, was like, hey garbage time is for killing i i'm going to do it all <laughs> now and, and same with same with delano banton to some degree but the the smash bros as it were thoughts on thoughts on those two uh, just consistently great um they always are ready to contribute and i want to talk about chris a little because i think um in a lot of ways we mentioned the same stuff with pascal in terms of comfortability figuring out who you are what you can play what play to your strengths right Boucher in that same way has gone through a development path, some kind of growth. He's gone through something these last couple of years in terms of who he can be and what he can be in the NBA, what he can be consistently on a night to night basis specifically. And I think he's, he's leaned into that this season. We see it. He's been phenomenal. You mentioned it off the top that like, you think he's, he's been better than precious. And while I, I, I think that's probably true. 
I would say that Boucher is at a point where he's just so much more refined. He knows what he wants to do consistently, how he can impact the game. I kind of liken it to, and I know you saw this tweet, but I mentioned Kyle Kuzma when I was watching the Wizards Sixers game as a preamble for this Raptors game. And Kuzma is, is, is a guy who knows who he is as well. He'll fill in a spot. He, he kind of in transition, he's filling a lane. He's playing great defense on the other side. He's not making that many mistakes on that end. And he is a good shooter. He can finish at the basket. He can kind of be a help side rim protector for you a little bit. Although Boucher is better at in that aspect than Kuzma. I'm not comparing them as players, but in the sense that they fill a role and they fill it really, really well. Um, so I think Boucher is a guy who just look six man of the year. Let's talk about it. Like, is there a chance? Do you think there's a chance that he could he could enter into the conversation? I feel like I'm being hot takey with that, but maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. It would be really, really hard for a guy to win six man of the year without playing like 24 minutes and up. He does need to play more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. He he would have to, but I I, I don't think he'll get that nod. I'm, I'm very happy and confident as I have been for some time saying this is one of the best bench players in the NBA though. And, and that's really what he is. And as yeah. you said, it's an understanding of self knowing how you impact the game, not only in ways that other players on the team don't, but in ways that teams have uh, a really hard time stopping. Because Chris Boucher, he went three for five from three tonight, which is great. But he also understood that while that might be a little bit of an outlier skill, it isn't enough to carry his game. But what he has over other middling big shooters who sometimes have good years, sometimes don't, is that his mobility is quite special. His motor, if paired with that mobility, adds a lot. And not only that, but his, his finishing touch is in a very special place right now. Like those leaning back finishes at the rim. It is with, interesting. With contests, yeah. all that kind of stuff. It's it's kind of, you know, you talk about having bigs who don't like basketball that much, but started playing basketball. <laughs> and, you know, you can tell when a big like doesn't really understand the game or maybe doesn't care that much. And... Boucher is a guy who has grown to understand the game and care and that paired with nice touch and his length. I mean, like it's a similar thing to Kuzma, right? As you said, Kuzma, a guy who struggled defensively for a long time, but also once it clicked and once if you're a long, bigger guy and you understand how your scheme works, you're just yeah. you're already so close to a plus defender that you if you kind of enable that in yourself, you're going to be there. And that's what that's what Boucher has done. And uh, yeah, he's one of the best bench players in the league, which is why, by the way, he's the Reggie Evans Award winner. Because of course, because of course. who else would it possibly be? Now I'm excited to get the top quick reaction comment because it's about Fred. Everybody knows, uh, you know, S is a big Fred fan. So oh, from God, Chilongo, man. quote, Fred really is an elite shooter and a very good defender. Like Boucher is a 25-minute burst of energy off the bench. I wonder if Fred could be talked into being a 25-plus minute burst of scoring off the bench at the guard position. That would really round out the bench and this roster nicely. End quote. S, <laughs> you first or me oh, first? Oh, this is this is you're feeding him to the sharks. Poor guy. He's a probably harmless question. I had no idea that I was pulling up. Um, Listen, man. Nah, look. Hey, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows I read the quick reaction comment, the top one, and respond to it, okay? True. That is the true. risk you run. And I agree yeah. with a lot of them. Usually it's kind of whatever. Sending Fred to the bench is a hot, hot, That's a hot take, take, might I add. Yeah. Um, I, okay, I'll start off by saying I understand where his lo – whoever this is, he, she, whatever, doesn't matter. But I, I understand where his logic is coming from. The fact that, like, there is a need for – someone else to come off of the bench, be this player who is a two-way stud, can shoot threes for you, can space the floor, can play make a little bit. Yeah, I get that. That's that's the perfect type of guy the Raptors need off the bench. But the thing is, Fred Van Vliet is just too good to come off the bench. He is just – it's tough to pick a guy to replace him with, to swap out for, because Fred Van Vliet is quite simply one of your best players. Sorry to break it to you. I'm sorry to I know that might be disappointing to hear. It's a pretty simple answer. It's the fact. It's the truth of the matter. The fact is the man is one of your best players. He is consistently, when healthy, contributing to winning positive basketball on the court. And there's really no 
there's no re- no real argument for bringing him off of the bench unless there is some dramatic change in his health. There is some dramatic change in how many minutes he can play. And therefore, that's a different conversation. But right now, expecting the fact that, you know, he's, he's going to be healthy once his back injury clears up. I don't really understand the the incessant need to want to bench Fred or limit Fred's role when I think he's done a phenomenal job this season when healthy. So, yeah, that's all I'll say on the Fred matter. Yeah, what I would say is that I understand why people want to lean into it, man. Especially after a night yeah. like tonight. It's two games in a row. The Raptors scored 139 and 143. Uh, Atlanta is going to be good this year. Uh, they they have a great squad. May, I don't think they'll be in the top four or anything like that, but they're a playoff team. The Spurs were 5-2 and two coming into this game. It might profile like the Raptors are world beaters without Fred. I will caution that idea, though, because a big part of Pascal's massive numbers passing out of doubles is that who is he passing the ball to? How effective is that pass? And Fred, as that release valve, not only as a shooter, but a guy who can put the ball down and then find the guy in the corner afterwards, is it can't be replaced, really. And Fred also, when healthy, is a guy who you can turn the offense over to when you don't have a night like tonight where Gary is hitting a bunch of pull-ups from 17 feet and you're getting everything you want in transition, so much so that OG may have not even taken two shots in the half court tonight, but still scored 18 points. Fred, while the Raptors offense has actually, by the numbers, been better without Fred on the floor, if you're thinking about the defense, they're still a better team when he when, defensively when he's on the floor. And if you look at over the years, both those things have always been quite good with Fred on the floor. And I honestly, I have a really tough time envisioning this team with Fred coming off the bench because... Yeah. One of, the, one of the best things is being able to pair Fred with those guys, w- with that shooting. Like in, in a game where everybody makes shots, where Chris Boucher goes three for five, where the Raptors get to bully everybody on the inside, where everything's in transition. I mean, hey, Fred is not necessary. Of course not. But the whole point about the NBA with this parody, with all the different types of basketball being played in this league, is like the same thing we ran into last year. You have to be adaptable. Game six Mm -hmm. against the 76ers, Pascal ran out of juice because the 76ers are daring everybody else on the court like, hey, it's not going to be Pascal. It's going to be you. And then it was nobody. And Fred, he adds a dynamism, not only as a screener, as a shooter, as a passer. While he underwhelms a lot of people as a lead guard who passes, I understand why. He underwhelms me at times too. But that shooting cannot be replaced. Neither can the screening neither can the secondary ball handling, and neither can the defense. Uh, Piecemeal, sure, some guys show up in different nights, but having a guy like Fred, when healthy, just step in in that lineup, uh, invaluable. He's he's a tremendous player. It, it, It seems wild that we're even entertaining it, but just to kind of give more context to what you're saying, we talked so much throughout this last, whatever, 40 minutes about complimentary players, guys who have figured it out, who can slot in wherever, the Kyle Kuzmas of the world, the Chris Boucher's of the world. Fred, at a very, very elite level, even more elite than, than Kuzma and Boucher, and actually at a star level, is one of the most complimentary players in the league in the sense that he can be put into any lineup and thrive just because of his skill set. So that type of player is hard to replace. That type of player is also hard to live without. And yeah, while I agree with you, you know, like nights like this, you don't necessarily need a guy like Fred. Hey, maybe that's a way to give him some rest as the season goes down and, you know, hope that in the playoffs you can get a more well-rested Fred. But at the same time, it's not something that's sustainable to say, bring Fred off the bench for 25 minutes a night and see what we can do. Because at the end of the day, um, it's just, it's not a recipe for success for the Raptors. Well, also on top of this, right, is that you look at the past two games, it wasn't the starting lineup that won the minutes. It was the transitional lineups. So like saying, Hey, we need Fred on the bench. No, (laughs) the the bench, like those (laughs) transitional lineups, They've, they've been winning minutes all year, the transitional lineups, particularly with Pascal. This was the first year they actually did it without him. But Fred needs to be in the starting lineup, and they need to figure that out. 
because yeah. it it has over like a basically once we get into November when Pascal returned last season, we're gonna have a year of this starting lineup being eh. There's too many good players. They kind of have to figure that out. And I don't think the answer is removing Fred for what it's worth. Uh, the starters still haven't blown anybody out of the water, even with him out. So uh, food for thought. You gave us a ton, Chilongo. Thanks for thanks for writing in. Um, keep writing in. And hopefully people like it and we get to respond to your stuff more often. But uh, yeah, yes, yes, that was like a, the end of a podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Uh, no, I appreciate you having me on appreciate uh you know the the comments and this is wild i'm on my first uh raptors reaction podcast with samson man this is this is a uh, something to check off of the resume here hell yeah it's Let's yeah the, la- the last bastion of of reaction pods this is it you know damn right yeah um <laughs> yeah s yes, thanks for coming on listener thanks for tuning in i hope you had a blast watching on youtube the next day i hope you're having a blast kicking with us um yeah it's just good fun make sure to subscribe to raptorsrepublic.com that's the one that costs money for me i think it's worth it make sure to subscribe on youtube and if you're listening it is on the podcast it. channel yeah and if you're listening on the podcast channel just keep doing your thing thanks for letting me speak to you after every game i'm gonna be here for the next 74 and then into the playoffs is the raptors i guess the next 16 because they're gonna win 4040 to the champion damn right surely s uh, for myself and S, thanks for tuning in. Whether you got into this in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye.